There has been a lot of talk about the U5, or Project Caesar, out there on the internet. There seems to be new things coming out weekly from the talks, as well as the trickle of information we gather from the Yoda comments. With that said, we now have had 7 talks and a decent chunk of mechanics and information being released. So my goal today is to make almost a summary of what we know so far, looking at what has actually been confirmed, and attempting to avoid speculation when not clearly stated. I will also be discussing some of the common concerns raised, and I hope to both build upon them and raise some new, hopefully helpful ones myself. With that said, what I will be covering today is the main content of the Tinto Talks. A lot more information does get revealed in the Johan comments below, but covering everything said there would easily add an extra hour worth of video time. If there's a desire for me to nitpick every comment and delve into them, I'm happy to do it. But let's be clear, outside of some of the major statements made inside the comments, such as the confirmation that there will be no burning slots, or the stun date, I will not be delving into them. Anyway, with that preamble out of the way, a like on the video would be appreciated if you haven't already, and a subscription would be amazing. With that said, let's start with Tinto Talk Zero. Namely, who are these people who are working on this game, before we get into the dev diaries. So the Tinto Talks, as the name may suggest, are done by, well, the Tinto Studio. This is a new studio that has been established in the kind of almost decentralization of Paradox Interactive and their development branch. Uh, Hearts of Iron, which I don't follow too much, I know has a studio that went up in Bulgaria recently, and EU4 got a lot of its development, and by a lot I mean I think all of it, literally exported to the Tinto studio in Barcelona, Spain. With that said, Tinto is not without its initial problems, especially in its setups. The first patch that was released with Tinto was Leviathan, and this is a rather infamous patch for a lot of issues. I don't think there's too much point here going into the details of the reception and the release of Leviathan, but let's just say that normally there's a design to say that something is literally unplayable almost as a joke. When it came to Leviathan, in many cases the game was pretty literally unplayable. We are talking genuine just random crashes while existing, monarchs running around with millions of mon monarch points, and even weird small things like double Minnesotas present on the map, right? To say that Leviathan was a bad release as a major understatement, I think Leviathan is probably the worst release DLC in EU4, and that's saying something, given that this game had such an extensive history of DLCs. Now, before we go and run and point fingers at Tinto, and to be clear, we are all welcome to do that, I'll be honest, I'm not exactly going to be able to stop you if you want to do that, I think an important bit of context that we need to recognise is that this patch was not started in terms of its development at Tinto Studio. This patch was started back at the old offices, and this patch was made while there was a migration into the new Tinto offices. On top of that, while this migration was happening, a lot of new developers came on and were hired onto the Paradox team, which of course meant that there had to be, well, some onboarding segments, as I'm not going to lie, there's not many companies out like Paradox there who make grand strategy kind of games with these specific engines. It's going to be a lot of new things being taught in that regard for, well, EU4. That, however, it's not my job to make excuses, and it's more of me to communicate that. I don't think Tinto was inherently rigged for success in this case. They definitely have a valid excuse that they want to take it. And in fairness, we'll get to the later releases, but Leviathan, it needed some excuses. Um, however, the with Leviathan, let's recognize something important. In terms of the scope of the update, of what they provided, it was pretty massive. We had a lot of new things being introduced, and of course all the new things were broken, but we had everything from monuments to content for things like Australia to honestly way too much things in the same patch. Southeast Asia got a massive update. We had this massive update for a lot of things and how they worked from previous updates, um, and especially when we have to consider things like the Sikh religion literally getting into tiny mechanics instead of previously being quite bare bones. Now, when they came out, they weren't great, but in terms of scope, in terms of their ambition, I think Leviathan was very good. It's just a complete failure in terms of execution. And in fairness to them, it took them a while to fix. Um, we're talking all the way from April to September. There was basically no major updates. They were just sitting there fixing Leviathan. It took them six mini versions to actually fix Leviathan to a state where it was good, and a couple of hotfixes to go from literally crashing every five minutes to somewhat playable. But at the end of the day, I think they got there. And looking back at Leviathan now, there's still a couple, what I like to call Leviathan artifacts, random Australian tribes with really overpowered ideas and things like that. But for the most part, the game's been pretty fixed. Seek doesn't have broken UIs nowadays. And there's no two Minnesotas on the map. But that's Tinto. That's kind of how they were set up. And they went in crashing and burning. 
Then we had Origins. I think Origins is basically the opposite of Leviathan in terms of not many new things are introduced. You basically got some mission trees for, granted, a very neglected area, Africa. Uh, Congo especially had a lot of things going on historically that was just not at all reflected. And they got them some mission trees to make up for that. A bunch of content was given out for Mali and Sonhai and those kind of tanks, which is cool. The thing is with that, it was an update focusing very much on the minor side of things. So as with opposed to Leviathan, which had this major scope and major amount of features, Origins at most, I think, in terms of features for the average person that was not playing in Africa, added some more monuments. So nothing too major there. So it wasn't really that they messed up that patch, is that there wasn't too much there to mess up with the Origin patch. But they certainly regained a bunch of their goodwill from Leviathan, especially compared to the release. And I think they kind of continued that. Lines of the North also followed a very minor level update, in the sense that we just got some deals, some extra missions for Sweden and Poland. And those countries finally got content. Poland did have missions before, but they were very lackluster. They are very much in, in tie with the old Ottoman mini mission tree before domination, basically. It was a very... Uh, it wasn't even a bad mission tree inherently. I mean, it gave you a 5% discipline event, uh, 5% discipline when you needed it, that kind of uh, mission. But at the end of the day, it definitely wasn't good and nowhere near the power level of the modern Poland and Lithuanian mission trees. But anyway, neglected areas, got updates, nothing too major to complain there. And I'll be honest, compared to the previous releases, they were yet again rebuilding that goodwill. Domination, I think, went along quite well. I mean, having had access, Domination is the first one I had access to now, I think King of Kings I had access to earlier was the first one. But even with Domination, even on release, it was pretty playable. And I think in terms of polish, it's probably one of the better, more polished things, which is quite impressive, considering the scope of Domination. We had a lot of new mission trees being granted. Now, that's not to say it was perfect. Let's not forget that main on release in Domination uh, had fun problems, like they had a mission that would decrease their in interest. But of course, interest per annum reduction is already negative. So they gave that negative interest per annum. What that meant is that once they would pop a mission that would basically fix their interest, what would happen is that interest, uh, sorry, their inflation, their inflation would skyrocket because it was a double negative, so they're actually gaining huge amounts of inflation from that mission. Which still was really funny. Anyway, that was domination. Um, I sort of relatively, relatively small issues and relatively small by paradox standards, of course. Like that, it was honestly a pretty good release. We do see a massive amount of, I think, since Origins. And Origins, to some limited extent, there was a bit of a... Um, there was some power creep, but especially Lines North and now especially Domination. A huge amount of power creep coming into the game at this point. But given that it's near the end of the EU4 life cycle, it's almost to be expected. Since we're not adding new features and new mechanics, and I think that was a decision I disagree with them. I preferred new mechanics, but it's a conscious decision they made, and that's a debate in game design, that they were focusing less on mechanics. With Domination, there was much less focus on mechanics. We kind of got some kind of centralization of the government powers, like Russia getting their little government buttons to press, same for the Ottomans, they got the little government buttons to press. That was mostly that for mechanics, to be fair. With that, a couple more patches, a couple more hotfixes, nothing too major. We move on to their latest DLC, King of Kings, and I think it kind of continues the relatively competent line of updates that we've had before. King of Kings, quite polished on release. This one I did have access to. Very late that I got access to that. Not a fault of anyone at Paradox or whatever in that regard, uh, just to be absolutely clear. Um, it was kind of... King of Kings kind of popped off well last when I tried to hold, do the whole YouTube thing certainly properly. So by the time I went through the channels and got access to the DLC early to like make a video on it before it comes out, well, that was like two days before it came out. But even the two days before it came out and I got my King of Kings, I played it and... If Leviathan was, I think Leviathan took three patches and a, three hot fixes and a patch to get to the stage that Kings of King was, Kings of Kings like influencer edition was before the release. So in terms of polish, I think that's probably their most polished one yet, and I think that's a pretty good precedent from the studio. If Leviathan tanked goodwill, I think these last four DLCs really recovered that. There is some game design philosophies that I may disagree with them, namely that I think they should have added a lot more features instead of just missions. But that's a disagreement over game design philosophy. I actually think the fact that Tinto is working on this in hindsight now, ignoring Leviathan, I think they've recovered from that Leviathan reputation, and I think that's probably a good studio to be working on EU5 now with their current track record. Now, however, let's move on to the main character of the show at the moment, and it's a bit hard to ignore him. Johan, he has been very instrumental in basically all things Paradox. He's had his uh, finger in many pots and a 
very successful amount of uh, releases actually from him, in my opinion. But this is where we now start to enter mini controversy. After all, he was the developer on Imperator, and we'll get to that. Um, Imperator, of course, being discontinued, hence people think, ah, he made this continued game, therefore this game will, E5 will also turn out bad. But again, let's let's talk about what he's actually done. And I think the main new era paradox game, although that was definitely a transitional new era paradox game that he worked on, was Stellaris. Now I played Stellaris on release. Pretty well, I don't think it was exactly on release, but pretty close to release. I think I'm most a couple weeks into release. So one of the first paradox games I got into, because at that point I already dabbled a bit in Crusader Kings 2, and then Stellaris was coming out, and I was like, ooh, space game, space cool. I like space. Let's give that a go. And I'll be completely honest, I love Stellaris release, and I continue to like Stellaris for quite a while. Um, at this point, I think I've run out of things to do in Stellaris in my single-player experience, but Stellaris I consider a pretty good game. Stellaris on release, if that came out today, would be, honestly, correctly, just completely nuked off the face of the planet. That game on release was awful, right? So many things were broken. So many things were just really weird in how they worked. There were like three separate types of drives then got centralized into high, into the hyperlane drives. Computer ship tracking and chance to hit was just straight up a lie with how it's communicated to players. It was not how that worked for a while. Stellaris had like two 2.0 updates that had to rework the entire like system of Stellaris. For one, reworking again hyperdrive. Secondly, reworking the planetary interface, I think twice, something stupid like that. Huge amounts of reworks all the time. And again, really weird stuff happening at some point. Like, for example, there was the concern that technology is too overpowered. The next tier of gun is just so much better than the previous tier. We need to nerf technology. But they did that in such a way that it actually became that the, the most optimal way of playing became the naked corvette, where you just completely ignore technology. You spam the basic le low-level corvettes. You spam those out in a swarm, and that's, that's it. That's the most effective way of playing. Uh, which... I mean, can be fun for once or twice, but again, very systematic of the issues Stellaris was facing. That thing was a lot worse release-wise than Imperator, and was leagues below so many other modern releases that considered bad. If Victorious 3 arrived in the state that Stellaris came in, forget that front lines would be weird and combat would be weird. Um, well, let's just not even imagine that kind of future. That was, by many people considered, that was just a very bad release, I think is the best way of putting it. But modernity has changed, standards have certainly increased, and I think that's a good thing that standards have increased. But And I will consider Stellaris a success in terms of its release from my personal view, but I think it's also important to bring that up. With that said, the other games that he's worked on in terms of their releases, I mean, Imperator is the big one. And with Imperator, I think the main issue there was the lack of content for things outside of Rome. Once you've played Rome and once you've played a tribe in anywhere, you've kind of played the whole game. There wasn't much else to distinguish them, and let's not pretend that in Vanilla Imperator, without the decent, without the recent like modding community updates, there will be a major difference between playing a tribe in Ireland and playing a tribe in Northern Africa. Like in terms of content-wise, they were very similar. Which, of course, was quite bad. And there was definitely a lot of focus on getting a lot of the mechanics right and getting a lot of the fundamentals down. But even then, I found that Imperator was a bit all over the shop with the game as it released. Because you had a family management system, um, to some extent similar to Crusader Kings 2 and 3. Which is neat, but also weirdly like put into a system similar to EU4 with mana development and nation building. A trade good esque system kind of imported from Victoria 3. And the worst part is all of this together worked still to a weird extent with how it interacted with, with itself in a surprisingly good way. Um, but let's not sit here with rose tinted sunglasses. I think Imperator, if EU5 releases in the state that Imperator released, this would not bode well. With that said, there is a major boon going for Imperator. Namely, the, uh, sorry, coming from Imperator, namely that, and I'll come into later when we get into the actual Tinto talks. With Imperator, a new engine was developed, and that engine, I'll be honest, ignoring the games made on it and just looking at the engine alone, is quite a good engine with what's, what's it worth. Um, like the ability to just zoom in on a province and having that dynamic going into a province view versus going to like a global view, 
and being able to tell at a glance terrain. Like in EU4, most people play in the politics map mode. Sometimes you go into simple terrain, but I cannot tell you at a glance which parts of Germany are forest and which parts of them are grassland. You, I have to click on the province and find out, right? But you can with the new map rendering done by the Leviathan engine. Sorry, not the Leviathan, the um, Imperator engine. That was also used in CK3 very successfully. And also to an extent within Victoria 3 as well. Well, not to an extent, that was the engine used in Victoria 3. So the fact that that engine is developed now I think is quite good because it means there's no resources being needed to develop this new engine. That can just be used and I think that frees up more time for the things that people care about, namely the content and missions to the countries. Anyway, that kind of spiraled on to a bit of a conversation at the engine, but that's Johan. He's had, I think, in my view, a good history of up of releases, but I can see why some people will be skeptical with Johan in charge of another project. With that said, he has a really amazing track record with what he's done for EU4, in my opinion. I've liked his releases and work on Stellaris. I've liked his other work even within Imperator and so on. So I'm personally optimistic. And if my opinion's worth anything, and I like to think that if you're here, you're probably here for the opinion, I think I'd rather have Johan working on this project than anyone else in the world as the main lead developer. Because even if you are critical of some of his decisions and recent updates, I think his track record still is makes him the most qualified out of everyone at the moment. Probably alive to work on something like E5. All right, enough uh, for praising Johan uh, as and his track record. Let's be honest, I've never met the guy, so uh, can't can't exactly uh, praise his personality. But with that said, and I think that's enough preambles of who these people are, and let's get into the actual Tinto Talks. Now, Tinto Talk 1 is going to be relatively short and sweet. It's just introducing the concept of the Tinto Talk. Nothing too much been mentioned here. This does kind of confirm to me, however, that Johan has been working on this, and especially to some extent, some version of this game for a while, because um, we met, he mentions, I believe, in this um, in this uh, in this dev diary somewhere around here that in yes, there we go, in Q2 2020, he started writing code on a new game, prototyping new systems that he wanted to try out. Sounds excellent. What happened in 2019? Imperator released. So he pretty much went from Imperator plus early release work to having a short little break. So basically a quarter of a year, which is fair. I mean, if I was in his position, I'd probably take a longer break, if anything. But, you know, I'm not him. And so we start seeing him work on this world, uh, on this game. So I think it's good that it's already been in development, at least conceptually in development for the last four years. I think that's a good sign. With that said, that's kind of it for this dev diary. Um, the main thing that he, or oh, sorry, Tinto Talk, the main thing that he mentions here is that outlining the goals and settings of basically EU5, as will be confirmed later. I mean, it hasn't still, it's technically not been confirmed yet, but for the most part being confirmed. Um, the goal being believable world, world, so somewhat historical immersion and making you think that this could have at least conceptually happened, even if we're not following the history textbook. The setting immersion, so the what if scenarios of, you know, Basically the same point as before, and another focus on replayability. Now I've weirdly enough seen a critique of this point, saying that what's the point of saying replayability? It's a paradox game, of course, it's going to be infinitely replayable. I feel like that's not a very good approach to have, because I still think you should work on the concept like that. Just because something is a paradox game does not make it inherently more replayable. Um, so bearing that in mind, and at least having that within your design philosophy, is a good thing to have. So I think for me, Nothing too much here to say that's an outline or an issue. We see that's been in works for quite a while, and I think this kind of sets the scene of what we're where to expect. If anything, it's kind of introduced the Tinto Talk concept. Right, there we go. Let's now move on to Tinto Talk 2, where the fun begins, because this is where we get our first main looks at the map. And as you all know, and we all love here, we all love maps. Right, they talked about choosing the projections to pick and all the other fun things and games. Now, later when people tried to... We got a couple more maps in Tinto 3 within this map. We tried to put... Um, and I say we, I think a guy in the Discord that I then stalked and I'm currently taking credit for. Uh, basically superimposed some of the other provided maps onto each other. And he noticed that the map superimposition didn't add up. So he had to like, distort India and distort um, a Byzantium when you put the two on indicating that there is some kind of mini distortion going on there. I can't exactly remember his points, I'll be honest, it's, it was a while ago. But the, the long and short of it was the map was still 2D and not the Imperator mini curve as you float around, uh, for better or for worse. So that's 
something that's good to know, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's something we'll come to. Let's talk about the main thing with the map. And first of all, that this screenshot here, in terms of how it looks and the little separation of mini provinces, basically sub-province counts, um, as well as the sea lanes, very much for me confirm two things from this kind of map setup here and this kind of mini map vibe of looks is very much giving me the Imperator engine being used here, which I think is good because I think that's a good engine. But that's, for the most part, my proof to it. This looks like the engine. They could have technically developed a similar looking engine that's completely different. I doubt they have. That makes very little sense to do, but technically it could have happened. But this is, this is my proof for it. And the other thing, though, is the proof of why this is EU5. And I've already made the same. I made a video on this earlier of why this is EU5. Namely because for the sea lanes and how we communicate between other provinces, well, this makes no sense outside of the EU5 time period or the EU4 time period or the EU time period, whatever you want to call it. Because, again, to repeat, to repeat myself from earlier, if we had something like battleships or something past the 1800s, like your steamships, they're not going to care about trade winds really at all if if even some so they will be fine just setting across the uh, the wasteland here and if we go earlier than e4 well we're not even setting out onto the ocean forget trade winds we're just not leaving the coastline so the fact that these exist indicate to me that this game is basically e5 simply because of the time period being set so with tinto talk 2 we see a lot more people jump in on that conclusion and there we go I personally have already talked about these sea lanes before. I think they're a cool addition because it means it's blockading things is easier. And I think that's a good step in the right direction in terms of making naval combat at least a bit more interesting. I'm not sure if it's possible to make naval combat good. Paradox games, and honestly most games struggle with naval combat being enjoyable. But I think it's a step in the right direction and I do wonder what happens here. I think this is a cool idea for the long short of it. Otherwise, we see some talk about terrain here, which I think is fair, and yeah, not too much else there. I will say, looking back to the main map, the main takeaway here is they are a lot more generous with wasteland provinces. Let's not forget the Amazon was almost somewhat colonizable in EU4, and the Sahara had just like two two walkways you could just colonize through, and the, the rest was it. So... I like the detail being assigned to it with these wastelands, and I think it's good to have more wastelands and more dynamic differences with how wastelands play out. And that's kind of it. I don't think they're overdone in this regard, but I'm just a bit worried about how many pathways there are through the African desert here. I hope it's not as easy as just picking one of these pathways, because... Hmm. We'll see. It shouldn't be that easy to work through the Sahara. But they did kind of mention that there will be half wasteland provinces that aren't really colonizable, but you can walk through them at the cost of major attrition. We'll have to see how bad that is in the final game. But that's about that. Anyway, that's the map. Not too much else was done in this dev diary in sorry, Pinto Talk, whatever you want to call it. Let's move on to the third one, where we get to the big developments, and this is where the fun and games begins for our game features. Pops. So, Pops have been done and implemented in other games, quite a few of them, notably missing from Crusader Kings 3, the Pop system, but we do see Pops in Victoria 3, Victoria 2, and, well, Stellaris, obviously, but also um, now being shoved into Imperator as well. Pops are a very requested feature and are definitely very popular, and I think they are, personally, I am of the opinion that's a good thing to have it as a population system. But I am going to have to echo a talk here from some of my, shall we say, friends in the MP community in that POPs are a very inherently weirdly unequalizing mechanic. Because at the moment, within EU4, there is kind of a cap to how many monarch points you can generate. If you're good enough at the game, you, you can make enough money to afford your level 5 advisors or afford your level 3 advisors at roughly the same time as most other people. Of course, there's going to be richer countries and poorer countries that develop differently, but a similar, a similar sized country in Africa and a similar sized country in Europe and a similar sized country in India can afford their level 3 and level 5 advisors at roughly the same point, assuming similar skill levels. And what that means is because population is kind of tied to development, Yes, it's harder to dev certain regions, but overall, it's just a slight debuff, and the game becomes how good you are at devving, so the skill really shows. 
And it does mean that people are able to play from behind. So an area that was very underdeveloped, like the Congo or the Kilwa, compared to something like India, can still perform and now scale. And it's up to the player really to do that and, well, get good at the game, basically. Um, and, well, win in multiplayer. With a pop system, it does mean that if you're in somewhere like Australia, it doesn't matter how efficient you are at managing monarch points. You're not going to be able to dev 100,000 people into existence so you can tax them. Now, this is something that has to be kind of almost prefaced that this is a very multiplayer balancing level concern. And when it comes to multiplayer balancing, I don't think games should be designed around that, uh, especially within the Paradox community, because multiplayer is already a small part of it. And furthermore, most multiplayer, well, lobbies tend to use an MP mod anyway. So they're already messing around with the balance. So ruining a single player experience for 95% of the people to make it slightly better for the 5% of the people that will then probably use the mod anyway, even if you appease them, is just not a good decision to make overall. But it is what it is. It's a concern that I wanted to raise. With that said, I think pops can be quite nice and effective, especially within the EU4 uni uh, sorry, Europe Universalis and this upcoming EU5 universe. And I think the main thing with pops is I hope they're implemented in a similar way to Imperator Rome, in the sense that they're a lot more dynamic with how their cultures and populations and religions work, because Dear Lord Alive is culture and religion weird in EU4 at the moment. I'm, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. A province is 100% culturally homogenous and religiously homogenous, and if you send a missionary over there and wait 10 months, then every single person in that province who was dedicated to being a Catholic for their entire life and ready to do so until the end of the universe itself is now convinced to be Orthodox forever. In fact, they're so convinced that even if another guy who was previously really powerful comes on, he can't do anything for the next 20 years as well because of recent conversion. The same is said there for the culture as well. You just The entire province just goes from in this case, from Greek to Bulgaria, to give a random example. Or Constantinople gets conquered by the Turks, the Turks press the button, congratulations. Every single Greek person in Constantinople is now speaking Turkish. Like, instant language learning lessons. They instantly understand how Turkish culture works. They are out there, ready to, you know, get on a horse and go do some, um, go do some hoarding, as the, uh, as the Turks were doing at this point, kind of thing. Like, no, right? So we're going to see, hopefully, a more dynamic and slower, but not even necessarily slower, but a more dynamic and not stiff kind of culture and religious system. And that can definitely be done quite well with the pop system in mind. So we'll see how that, of course, works out. I think this is a good thing to have. And I think one of the positives that I have to mention then is they're immediately talking about performance. And that's good because pop systems can definitely get laggy. I'm looking at you, Stellaris. Not every single pop needs to check every single available job every single month. Okay, that, I'm not sure you were cooking with that one, but let's not cook there, right? With many, uh, with many slides of Stellaris out of the way, I think the fact that already concerned about performance is a good thing. But saying you're not you're concerned about performance and then not doing anything about performance isn't really helpful. Unfortunately, I can't really judge the performance of the game outside of a dev diary, so this is now in the realm of speculation. I hope it's good, and the fact that they're talking about it indicates they're at least working on it or considering it, which is good. But that's kind of this, it for this dev diary. The main thing that we got from this one is, of course, this map here, which gave us access to some of the population counts and some kind of geographical borders. So we started to see predictions of the start date coming from Tinto Talks 3. And, of course, this screenshot very much does give me the look of, if not Constantinople, at least Byzantium. Or as a kind of demographic breakdown. So, of course, all the Byzantium boos are happy in the process. And you know what? That's fair. I feel like appeasing to the Byzantium boos is a great financial strategy for Paradox Interactive, since 102% of the audience seems to love Byzantium. With that said, that's again kind of it for this dev diary. Uh, we see a lot more cool speculation coming out from the game at this point, and since we have a lot more material to work with in terms of the maps, we start to see a lot more of the community fiddle with them around and see what they can deduce already. Which means by Tinto Talk 4, the start date is for the most part confirmed at 1337. And with the start of Tinto Talk 4 and the start date confirmation with one of the comments, I think it's time to address one of the big elephants in the rooms as a concern. EU4 already covers a really major part of human history. We're talking 1444 period to 1821 is already well over 300 years, 370 odd years of human history and very large changes human history. 
right? One of the major events that happens during this period and isn't even concluded, but is almost in full swing and to some extent even turning down a bit, is colonialism. And the thing is with something like colonialism is that as an institution, specifically the European overseas colony type of colonialism, affected pretty much everyone on the planet. Whether you were the person doing the colonizing, or as a person who got colonized, or as one of the two examples of the countries, like your Ethiopia and Japan, that modernized and resisted colonization. To the Ethiopians to less of an extent, but eventually the Italians did get them. But yeah, this is some kind of thing that has an impact on humanity as a whole, as an institution, for lack of a better word, if you want to call colonialism an institution. And a lot of things are happening within this time period. We are seeing things like the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, the rebirth of Rome. I mean, basically look at the list of EU4 institutions for things that are changing. The question becomes is how does a game with its limited game mechanic systems, at least somewhat believably, as they're talking about in Tinto Talk 1, so building believable worlds, represent these kinds of changes, right? Because modeling something like an army in a levy-based system is already kind of wrong for a term period of 1444. France does not really have a standing army in 1444, not, neither does the UK. They have a peasant levy system for where they levy troops. In fact, you don't see standing armies until much, much later within the EU4 time period. But EU4 just kind of models that by just throwing together this year 4 summit, good luck. It's, it's a weird system and the major amount of transitions and, I mean, very fundamentally, the changing nature of warfare means you basically need five or six different combat mechanics just within the TU4 time period. With the game starting in 1337, and I guess the end date not being confirmed, my issue then becomes is how well is one game which has to represent 1337 combat and 1337 medieval warfare also accurately represent Nap Napoleonic armies um, that are millions of men strong that are standing armies out in the field with professional soldiers, at least to some extent some professional soldiers. To varying degrees of professionalism, of course. I mean, the changing nature of warfare is one thing. The development of Western military tactics as a whole occurs at this point. And let's not forget we go from knights in shining armor, very literally in 1337, to going through the entire musket early medieval period to guys on horses running out with guns and other things like that, right? To artillery warfare under Napoleon. That is a major shift in many different conceptual approaches to warfare. How do you represent that within a system like EP4? I'm not saying it's impossible, I'm just saying it's really difficult. And given how honestly badly it's done within EU4, you just see a very minimal transition from you don't use cannons to you do use cannons now to it's very important to use cannons now. That's kind of it, right? You still have your standing army, there's no levy-ish system in place. The closest we get is the Ethiopian Kawa units, which are made cheaper so they are almost semi-look like they're levied. But that's about it, right? It's it's a weird situation to be in, and that's just talking about the military warfare. What what happens to government administration and mechanics? And this is where we talk into this, like you know, into the spirit. We see the rise of political absolutism. We see the movement away from a feudal system where the king has no idea, where the king of France would have no idea what the Duke of Normandy is up to in his personal spare time, to a very centralized burst from this ideas of absolutism system where the government does actually have an idea what's going on with Normandy, at least to some limited extent, so it can tax it, right? How do you represent these kinds of transitions in a game? And I, I really hope they're able to pull it off at least better than new 4 And they kind of have to, because with the game starting in 3077, they have an even larger period to cover, potentially, with this transition. Secondly, and building up on all of this before we kind of get into Tinder Talk 4, the main concern has to be raised over... Well, people don't tend to play EU4 past 1550. I mean, I go for World Conquest, I do challenges, I do those kinds of things, so I tend to play past 1550. I've also played a decent chunk of Ampernut, where there's a lot of content and missions that go past 1550. For me, I find usually reasons to go into the late game, but I think I'm the exception in this regard. A lot of campaigns, and a lot of people's campaigns, end in 1550 because they've usually achieved their goals and are bored at this point of what they will be doing, right? They've become the regional power, if they want a death war, they can beat everyone on the block. What now? Right? It's a weird situation to be in. But it's kind of made even worse if the game starts in 3077. 
Because that does mean that by the time colonialism kicks off, by around the 1450s, or whenever you want to say colonialism really kicked off, or the Portuguese and the Spanish anyway, well, mostly Portugal at this point. Anyway, sorry, I digress. When you have that system like that, by the time colonialism actually starts, most people have probably played the game from 1337, got to 1450, and called it a day. Right? For them, that's it. They've they played the game, they've done their goals. They've, which means that you kind of have an EU4 game where a lot of people are not playing past 1450 if we inherit this kind of mindset and approach from EU4. Now, let's be clear. We can blame the players all you want over the players not wanting to experience the late game. But EU4 does not exactly provide an amazing late game environment, right? The revolutionary mechanic in EU4, I think, is relatively cool. But can definitely be expanded instead of just being a glorified republic with, you know, with recolored absolutism. And outside of that, there really is very few things going on within the late game, right? For you to do. Furthermore, this is added by the nations, the AI, kind of blobbing into these very annoying cohesive states that do make sense, but are also just a lot less fun to fight. Because you exist in a situation where you know you're stronger than them, you know you're better than them, you know you're going to win the war, but it's just a kind of a grind to, well, grind down the victory, right? And that just isn't fun. So there is an element of design to it as well, as well as mental approaches with how goals have been set. Hopefully longer mission trees or whatever ends up happening in this game, although I believe at some point they'll confirm there's no mission tree. What, I'm get what I guess I'm getting with this point is... I hope there's designs and systems in place that would encourage you playing more than 50 or 100 years into the game for each campaign. Because if not, we're going to see a lot of campaigns starting in 1337, not actually getting even to the EU4 star date of 1444, right? That's kind of the main concern there over the earlier start date, and we'll, we'll see how that is alleviated. And we'll start with that. There's, at this point, this is kind of speculation over what's going to be in the game. I don't know. I don't have the game. But we'll see. Anyway, Tinto Talk 4, for the most part, just basically introduces the concept that, yep, there are five different government types. Your monarchies, republics, theocracy, steppe, hordes, and tribes. Again, makes very much sense for the EU4 as a system. And we kind of have these like little playing cards. Very victorious three aesthetics on these graphs. So again, indicating to me the same use of engine there. Uh, these kind of like almost playing cards. And aha, I play Autocracy. My monthly progress to Aristocracy plus 0 0.1. Um, or I play Bashers. Minus 10% unrest. Woo. That's kind of like the vibe I'm getting from them. But that's neither here nor there. I think it's good. I think it indicates a relatively dynamic government system that allows for a lot of customization between the Principality of Wales and the Kingdom of Sweden. Or the Crown of Aragon as they mentioned themselves. I think it's good, and when it comes to things like your, um, well, they mentioned the Abbot Efficiency, they mentioned that the Advisor system is kind of getting reworked into our Royal Court. They hint towards this here, and they're definitely going to hint towards it later in the later Dev Diaries, but we see, we're see we seeing almost a return to the Slider system, which I think is cool, because Sliders were in many places, I mean, believe it or not, Sliders were even in, in your Civ games. Back in the day, in your older Civ games, you had Happiness and Science Sliders. And they really fell out of fashion as a game design choice. Maybe there was some reason for it. Maybe there wasn't. I mean, one of the main things with EU4 is I feel like sliders are put in there almost to tick a box. Because, let's be honest, even if you have used the EU4 sliders in the economy tab, when was the last time you had the slider for the army? Anything that was in the minimum or the max? When was the last time you had the colonization budget slider on anything but the max? When was the last time you had the missionary slider on anything that wasn't the maximum or the minimum, right? You never want to go like, ah, oh, yes, I would like to take my colonization 75% speed, please, right? So it's something you do. You don't really go into a battle thinking, hmm, yes, I would like my armies to fight 20% worse, please. Let me uh, not put my army slider up with the full way, right? It's just, it's a very, instead of being a slider, it could have easily just been a take yes, no system, for lack of a better word. But... Again, I hope they're implemented well within E5, but we definitely see almost a return to the slider-based system. As for the governments themselves, there's not too much more to complain about here. I'm not sure if they use like a reform progress uh, system as they have in E4, where you unlock more of these as you go around, or you have to meet certain conditions or do like almost a Victoria 3 parliament roulette to pass new reforms, 
or change your languages. That we'll have to find out of exactly how it's implemented within the game. With that said, that's kind of it for the government in basic introduction, for lack of a better word. Let's move on to Tentative Talk 5 now, which is more now talking about the actual estates. So this is the um, this is the aristocracy that we're influencing earlier. And I think this is a cool system because within EU4, I think one of the things that's really not talked about is this conflict between court and country. There is basically a disaster for it and your estates can get influenced or whatever, but there really was a very much a back and forth in this time period for a decent chunk of this time period between centralized authority of the crown, the authority of the church within the clergy, the authority of the nobility, the authority of the burghers, and even the weird mix and mashes of that in the sense of, for example, in Venice, the burghers, the merchants, in essence, almost acting as the nobility within that domain. And then, of course, the push of basically who got to oppress the peasants the most and extract value out of them. <laughs> So I think the fact that it's more of um, almost considered within this dev diary as a kind of combat between the satisfaction and the powers of certain estates, I think is good. And the fact there is this distinction between influence and not directly lead to happiness of a state is also important. The aristocracy within the French 15th century and 16th century aristocratic systems were quite happy to be aristocrats, which I guess makes sense, despite holding increasingly diminishing power because of the court system held in France within the French court, in the way that proximity to the monarch basically granted you power. You wanted to fight within the aristocrats instead of team together to increase your own personal standing as a kind of system. And I think dynamicisms in that re d dynamic systems in that regard would be cool and are almost enabled by the state. They talk a bit about here, like the impacts of having your uh, your estates up. I think we're going to see a return to the Victoria 2 kind of tech progression because we see that clergy impacts your research speed and diplomatic reputation, which I don't know why the clergy is doing diplomacy, but you know, if they if they, if they want to send the local priest down to uh, go talk to the, um, if they want to send the local priest to give a talk to the Ottomans, I mean, he's welcome to do that. I just don't think he'll be coming back. But outside of that, there's not too much to say here. Estate privileges we're all familiar with from EU4, I hope. Not too much to see there. I think the allow peasants to migrate, again, is an indication of the pop system. Still existing and being cool, so I think it's a plus one from me, but... <laughs> what else am I meant to say here? Pop system. It exists. And a state system conceptually good. I am slightly worried, however, in one of the things that they have mentioned here, being that like something like a thousand nobles give a flat 50 state power, and a thousand peasants give flat 0.05 estate power. I hope it still allows for setups like the French court, where necessarily having more nobles actually decreases each noble's individual power kind of thing. But we'll have to see when the game comes out how that ends up getting implemented at the end of the day. And the fact they have a dynamic system between the pop, between the estate happiness and the estate power, I think to me in the case there will be room for that in terms of its implementation. Otherwise, yeah, this kind of allows for a transition between the crown holding very little power being relied on these states to centralized power and also a way to represent the internal revolts and risks that happen from this kind of transition. But again, let's see when the game comes out what we actually end up working with. Right, that's the estates. Not too much to happen here. They gave us another cool map to work with. Um, cool, but again, stun date's already been kind of confirmed, so we can just look at a history map at this point to see what's going on in that regard. Anyway, Let's move on to Tinter Talk 6. We, they talked a little bit about some of the changes they've implemented, so it's nice that they're listening to feedback. I appreciate that, but again, I'll judge the final product when I have it in front of me. Um, listening to a feedback once does not inherently make the game better, right? After all, the feedback could be bad. So <laughs> that's something I have to say, for lack of a better word. Um, but I think it's good that they have their eyes out and they're not like dead set in their ways that they have this idea of implementation X and they're going to stick with X until, you know, until hell freezes over, right? We're, they're, they're happy to, to change things. And I think that's a good approach to have. With that, however, we move on to a system that I very much like, and I do quite like the ideas behind this. And that is namely control. EU4 was weird in the sense that you started with this hyper-centralized capital, which you kind of still do in here. And the goal was to basically over-centralize the rest of your country to this extent. 
where you have zero autonomy everywhere and you're extracting all the possible value you can out of your provinces. You don't really want any backwaters that are far away from your capital and the court that you have no idea of control over. Because it's pretty much always better to state the entire planet and if you're out of GovCap, get more GovCap. So you can state the entire planet and develop it all to be basically every single province is a 50 dev mega city, right? In terms of pure numbers of troops fielded, economy fielded, etc., that became the optimal way, quote unquote, of playing. Stating the entire universe and extracting value out of it. What we start seeing here is a difference between basically urban centers being discussed here, like cities like your Beijing, Alexandria, and Paris, towns like your Stockholm, Dublin, and Belgrade, and, well, rural provinces, which are basically just villages dotted around farms, which is an important distinction to have. Because at the end of the day, the towns need food. They can't grow too much without supporting agriculture around them. And I, as they've talked about food already, I hope that's very much reflected. With that said, one of the things that is also mentioned here is you can build like bailiff offices to create little extra points of proximity so you don't get that many backwaters. I really hope that the optimal way of playing does not become dev every single province and invest loads of money into it so it becomes hyper profitable shove a um, like a office that looks after the province in every city or the whatever they called it shove one of those in every single province under the sun so you just have 100 percent control everywhere and it's actually somewhat a dynamic system that is my concern and that just would be the optimal way of playing aiming for 100 percent control everywhere disproportionately early when you should be able to do that historically but we'll see how that ends up getting implemented the basic idea however for now is you have your centers of power and the further away you get from them, the less control you have over the area. More control means you can levy more troops from an area, and those things that go join your market. But less control means that your crown power in that area, so I guess how you can implement your laws decreases. And you get less manpower and sailors from the location. There's also a weird mention we'll get to later over sea control, or maritime presence for lack of a better word. But yeah, I very much like the system. And one of the other reasons I like this is because I like building infrastructure. I'm one of those weird people. And infrastructure in E4 literally doesn't exist. And when mods add things like roads, they tend to be really useless because they basically do things like, ah, oh, here's 15% friendly movement speed. Great, amazing. What a That was very much worth spending 100 ducats building on. Um, the fact that now roads basically decrease the effective proximity means that they're probably going to be quite good things to build, depending on how effective they are. Again, we'll need to see final numbers. But the fact that roads actually matter, I'm very much looking forward to. So we'll see how that ends up working, of course, but I think that's a good step in that right direction. Next, let's talk about maritime presence. Piracy was really is really irrelevant in the EU4, just full stop. You make a very little money privateering. Even if you build around privateering, like completely invest into privateering, get loads of privateer efficiency, do all these things to make bank privateering, you're better off investing the exact same amount of resources into just normal trade and making like 20 times the amount of money. And you do that without taking away the money from other people. So you end up not pissing them off. So they have, don't have a reason to go find them, right? Piracy, however, in this game and from their mention, is going to decrease your maritime presence, which is basically your coastal control. And I think that's good because that means people are going to care a lot more about piracy. So it's going to be a lot more impactful. With that said, I just find it a bit sad how in a game that took part during the golden age of piracy in the Caribbean and when piracy was quite a big deal. I mean, it was a big thing beforehand as well, let's be honest. Piracy hasn't even gone away today. But for a game taking place during the golden age of piracy, piracy was just so irrelevant. And it could be defeated by just shoving, shoving 20 heavy ships of protect trade and there you go, it's gone. And at the same time, because it was such a neglected mechanic, you could stack 200% privateer efficiency, and unless you declared war on, the t on that country, so you can actually fight their pirates in combat, it doesn't matter if you had a billion cannons protecting trade, because you'd reduce privateer efficiency by 99%, but then have 200% privateer efficiency, so it's still privateering you at 100% plus 100% strength. Great, what a feature. Anyway, weird complaint from that, but yeah, that does mean that pirating and even blockading is going to be a lot more impactful, and I think that's good. It means that there's a very genuine reason for a country like Sweden to invest in their navy to maintain their maritime control over these areas because they do not want to get, be getting blockaded. They don't want to be losing their you know, control over the area. And it also means countries like Sweden, if they're fighting someone like Denmark, can go ahead and blockade them and very actively hurt their enemies through blockading. Blockades have a major impact on a country 
and a for the most major impact to get from a blockade is a bit of a tick in devastation and you'll eventually have to spend 50 at it, right the fact there's almost a focus on it from now i think is a good precedent and for me i think that's a very strong positive that maritime presence is very much tied to well how good your navy is so navies would matter let's hope that's that's the case but for the most part that's the the end of this um, the end of this Tinto talk I think so far so good, but let's talk about the first one, the first of the economy ones, and the last one of today. Tip talk seven, tax. Fundamentally, let's address the big issue in the box right now. Taxes in EU4 are really, really weak. And I think one of the main reasons for that is trade income and production income are just leagues ahead of taxes and how much money you can make from them. And frankly, trade in EU4 is way too overpowered. You can print way too much money with trade. Even it, by just taking control of your home node and starting to steer a bit from the other two, just having a trade node and a half, you're probably already exceeding your income from trade than you will be from everything else, right? Even countries that notoriously do well with taxes in the early game, your Frances, um, your Englands that just have the money to build your churches, those kind of tax. Even then, even then, they're just better off massively investing into trade. And if you get past the 1600s, Tax becomes completely irrelevant. There have been so many campaigns where I'm looking at my budget and I'm like, right, I'm making 3k a month from tax. I'm making 2.5k a month from production. I'm making 300 ducats a month from taxes. Why am I collecting taxes? My, my surplus is like 2k a month. I do not need to be collecting taxes. My bottom line is not impacted. In fact, in many cases, my bottom line is literally not impacted because I've hit the money cap, right? I've literally genuinely wished for an EU4 button to have where I could just say, you know what, peasants, how about this? I don't tax you, you stop rising up, right? You know, you let me go on my campaigns and I just stop taxing you. And of course that never happened historically because taxes were the main ways that countries made money, unless there's something like the Venetian Merchant Republics. And even then, they made their, ta they made their money by taxing trade. The government didn't own all the trade in the country that's not no no that's not how that worked right e4 in that sense does economy very weirdly and frankly quite badly in terms from a historical accuracy point of view so the fact that we see within this center talk almost a movement straight away to taxation and taxation as an income source i think is a good step in the right direction for how a country would be done today you make most of your money from taxes back in the day you make most of your money from taxes for most of human history, nations would make most of their money from taxes, right? I wouldn't, you're never really in a position where you've, you know, conquered half a continent and going, should I stop taxing my people? I'm making enough money from production, right? That's not really something that happened in any conceivable way. Right, enough of mini rant about taxes being actually important. Let's consider now within Team to Talk 7 how they're implemented here. Well, there are privileges and other estate interactions that let you change how much you tax certain estates. And it was mentioned in the previous comment as well, that money that's not taxed from those estates is going to be spent by the estates on certain things. So, it does mean that there will even be some benefits from not taxing your estates. Although, I'm not going to lie, if you're not taxing your aristocracy and then the aristocracy uses that, that money to pay for an army to fight you, I think that would be great from a realism point of view, and I think that would be really funny and make some great campaign stories. But I certainly find that very annoying. Like, come on, guys. I want you to build infrastructure. Stop trying to build up an army for the 19th revolt against me, right? However, that is an implementation issue. And I can't really comment on that until I see the game and the sense is given to me. Anyway, and that's that debate. Within this kind of income, we will see that there's multiple sources of it. Basically, the estates previously mentioned how much we're taxing them and the impact of those taxations on their, fund on their final, like, balance sheet, as it were. Another thing that I think is really good, and I, def I absolutely adore this, and I'm really sad that this is not in other games, is the fact that they've added minting as a form of income, basically how much money are you printing. That, of course, naturally would lead to inflation, printing more of it. However, it does mean that, hey, there's another slider for us to shove up, screw it, let's print our way out of the debt. It's a technique used by many countries, and it's weird that you couldn't really do it before. I mean, you've kind of had a debased currency button, but it would give you corruption for some reason. I mean, E4 was very weird in that regard. The fact you couldn't mint or print more money was very weird for a game that took part during the rise of banking and the banking families in the 15th century, right? 
we literally see the modern financial system being born within this time period. Why can we not print money, right? So we'll see how that works out. Then there's other like sources of income. The fact that interest there starts at zero tells me that yes, you can borrow money, but I hope you can also lend money out and make money by lending money in a Victoria 2 style loan system. That would be cool. Trade income to me raises a bit of a red flag in that I'll be going back to an E4 trade system. But we'll see how that works out. I hope that's just tariffs on trade coming in kind of thing. Diplomacy, you can subsidize people or you can sell people port fees, whatever. The fact that selling food is a separate category is interesting. I think the fact that there's already a lot of focus on food, especially from the earlier talks about an ability consuming food. So when you put down the sheriff's office, they'll have a higher food demand, which is why I mentioned that you need to dev the province to get those farms there going. I think that such a, uh, such a strong focus on food is good. It's going to make things like the little ice age going to be a lot more impactful on how people hopefully play the game and will reflect the local period, which had a lot of famines and a lot of issues of drafting the peasants for war so they can no longer work the farms. I think that's going to be a good system and a rather dynamic one of that. And I hope it's fleshed out very well. The fact that there's already a focus on food from a lot of these screenshots, I think to me is a good sign. So we'll see how that works out. And then there's, of course, the very direct mercenary income. So, hey, your Swiss mercenary role play, woo, you can go ahead and have fun with that. That's represented, and I think that's good that's mentioned there. Again, we see a return back to sliders, and compared to the earlier sliders, or the sliders in E4, I think having, like, attack sliders is quite good, because you can literally want, you know, tax and ability up until they're 50% happy, or tax and ability low enough so they're 60% happy, or any kind of specific things like that. And, of course, there's a lot of dynamicism. One of the things I mentioned, for example, is that Catholic religions cannot tax the clergy, which is fair enough. I mean, you can probably get some papal sanctions to levy church taxes or whatever, but we'll see how that ends up happening and how that's implemented. I think that's cool and allows for a lot of dynamic differences in how countries will play. For example, I'm assuming within some countries, tax and ability is going to be a lot more of an issue than tax and ability in others, and so on and so on. But yeah, that's that. And I think it's a pretty good loadout from what we see so far. I'm pretty happy with the system. We'll see how that ends up going. When it comes to expenses, yeah, I mean, the classics. I do like how cost of the court is now its own like little expense. It's kind of like almost your global advisor like pay rate. Well, court advisor or how much you spend on your court. The fact that the slider is cool because it to me means that like, ah, the economy is not doing too great, guys. Sorry. I still want to like have you around for your monarch point buffs, but actually I'm nuking your cost of uh, you know, the, your salary and things like that. I mean, we'll see how it's implemented and how that works out. But I quite like the sliders for here as well. I will have to raise a concern over army, navy, and fort maintenance. We're back to a slider. And in, in what universe am I having army, navy, and maintenance, and navy and fort maintenance either not 100% up or 100% down, right? I, I'm just... I struggle to imagine a situation where I wanted to pay my Navy 75% of their salary. I'm either paying them the minimum because I'm not fighting, or I'm paying them the maximum because I am fighting, kind of thing, right? That's a thing, and I guess that's my issue with the other sliders of like cost of qualities or culture. I can see stability being paid for to like maintain stability or slowly gain it, but for me, I feel like the stability slider is going to sit on mostly three positions. At the bottom because we're out of money, so we're sacking our stability at around plus 0, 0.0 stability, or at like the maximum because we're trying to increase the stability. <laughs> there we go, that's that. We see food mentioned again, we see diplomatic expenses, we see trade expenses. I'm a bit worried again with the trade expenses because trade expenses to me tells me that this isn't tariff income, this is how much money you're making from trade. We'll see how that ends up working out, but again, it's a bit hard to comment on that apart from this system exists. It worked great in some other games. It has some issues that I mentioned before. Until I get my hands on a game that I can talk about, it's a bit hard to mention how these mechanics will individually look at, you know, work out. But that is what we do know. There is going to be an extensive food system. With that said, that's kind of it for the most part. Another thing that I'd also like to quickly mention is they, me they mention income from mining um, at some point. So basically... Oh, sorry, the income from minting. The uh, reason I sorry, wanted to mention min uh, mining specifically is how is things like gold mines going to be reflected within EU5? There were countries that were very much built off the back of gold. Spain is the most famous example, bringing gold from the new world for the treasure fleets. But also, you know, 
the local countries were significantly wealthier and countries did fight over gold mines, right? Over the Kosovo gold mine, there was conflict and the gold reserves there. Um, you know, gold does matter. And a lot of the reason for that is because states can raise money by, min well, basically mining gold out of the ground. Literally mining money out of the ground, right? How is that going to be represented? Because I'm not seeing a income from gold kind of slider here, just taxes and that. Maybe it goes under other income, we'll see, but that's the kind of thing I want to mention. Anyway, so basically state-owned mining enterprises, right? Even even your favorite Sweden, they had the, uh, the, the, the massive copper mine. How does that get represented as an economic boost to Sweden? Well, we'll have to see in the final game. But there we go. This is the newest dev diary that, well, just came out today. Overall, pretty happy with some of the sliders. I'm still a bit worried about the redundancy of others, but so far so good. But yeah, that's about that. With that said, that is all seven Tinto talks for the most part summarized. I hope you uh, enjoyed watching this for the, as much as I enjoyed making it. But that is unfortunately all we'll our time for today. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.